Final Fantasy XV, the game that has everything Final Fantasy fans have come to expect from the epic franchise of high fantasy and adventure. Castles, magic, monsters, truck stops, fishing, stopping for gas, and a mechanic who seems to have forgotten most of her clothes. Seriously, I like women, but this level of titillation in a video game is just uncomfortable. Not to mention that she doesn't fit in with the aesthetic of the game at all. But then again, nothing in this game really does fit, does it? Final Fantasy XV is a beautiful disaster. The title screen says a Final Fantasy for all fans and newcomers, but is it really any of those things? This video is going to be a little different from most of my content. First, not only are we covering a much newer game, but I will not be capturing the gameplay myself because I have no desire to ever play this game again. This footage was captured by Shirako. Please visit their channel via the link in the description and be sure to subscribe to their channel to thank them for uploading this footage. Now I should qualify that statement by telling you now that after I wrote this script, I did start playing the game a little bit more just to revisit it. So, I didn't want to play the entire game again from the beginning, but I did kind of pick up where I left off and just kind of give it a little bit of a fair shake. On that note, you'll notice that during this video I will be ad-libbing a little bit more because I didn't get all my thoughts down. And since I started playing the game again after I wrote the script, I have a few more thoughts that I might tack on here and there. So if it sounds a little unpolished, that's why. I feel the need to preface this video by saying that this is from the perspective of an old school Final Fantasy fan. I grew up with this series. My first exposure to the series was the very first game in the franchise, Hironobu Sakaguchi's magnum opus Final Fantasy. For me, the franchise was irrevocably changed once Sakaguchi left the company. For this reason, my expectations of what a Final Fantasy title should offer may be different from yours. I have a number of issues with Final Fantasy XV as a game, and even more issues with Final Fantasy XV as a Final Fantasy game. But in the interest of fairness, I would like to start by talking about what Final Fantasy XV does very well. First off, the game is absolutely stunning. From the moment your K-pop boy band leaves the fairy tale city for a tourist trap somewhere in Arizona, the game constantly delivers breathtaking visuals. The world is truly alive and bustling with tremendous detail. The grass blows in the wind, sun sunlight reflects off the vehicles, and sweat drips off the brows of the characters that you interact with. The extremely high production values mean that cutscenes and even some parts of the gameplay really look and feel like a Hollywood movie. It's skillfully directed, and it makes the extensive use of wide shots, sweeping shots, and various camera angles, it really drives home a very cinematic feel. While the opening of the game uses a kind of confounding cover of Stand By Me that's very Final Fantasy stylized, I guess you might say, the game itself is otherwise brilliantly scored, as any Final Fantasy should be expected to be. That's one thing I absolutely cannot take away from this game, it's got an amazing soundtrack, just like all Final Fantasy titles have had. As you progress through the game, you visit some really amazing and breathtaking places, and the environment design in the game is incredible. Even though all locations are based on what seems like vacation spots, it does make you feel like it makes you feel like you're on a vacation the whole time. That's the one thing that really does kind of kind of um, hurt the game, but I'll talk more about that later. The main takeaway for this portion of the video is just to discuss and describe that. All the environments are really nice. It's all really beautiful. I definitely was struck more than once at just how good some of these places looked. The writing is, for the most part, very good, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. And the voice acting is probably the best I've seen in a localized game. I never felt at any point during this game like the dialogue was corny or cheesy. It never felt forced or hokey. It always felt like it made sense and it worked. I think that's... that's high praise in a game like this. A lot of times these games, they rely so much on these juvenile tropes, and this one really doesn't do that. It's a very grown-up script, it's a very smart script, and the overall writing and pacing is pretty good. I won't say very good, but it's pretty good. 
Now, before I start talking about what I don't like about this game, I, I want to point out there's one more thing that I really, really do love, uh, just kind of as an aside, and one of the party members, Ignis, he's a cook, right? And he'll come up with new recipes as you journey through Lucis, uh, as you're doing side quests, as you find new items, and this was probably the most fun part of the game for me. It doesn't hurt that the food he cooks looks really delicious. I've been tempted to order takeout on more than one occasion while I was playing this game. Uh, I've never wanted broiled eel more in my life than when uh, <laughs> than when uh, Ignis made a similar dish in the game. But there there are a really uh, amazing, a few really amazing cinematic events that take place throughout the game, and they're of extremely high quality. The Behemoth Hunt is fantastic, and every time you encounter an Esper, you're in for a very exciting experience. Now, before we continue, I want to clarify that all of this is just my opinion. If you disagree, that is absolutely okay. In fact, I want to hear your thoughts. Leave a comment and tell me what you think about Final Fantasy XV. I know that Final Fantasy fans are very, very passionate, but I also know that we're very divided with some of these games. Some of us feel very strongly about it. I mean, the debates are always raging online about these Final Fantasy games. So, and now's your choice to have your voice heard, discuss it in the comments. I want to put one more quick warning out there. This video is going to contain many spoilers. So if you have not completed this game yet, if you don't know how it ends, if you don't know what happens during the course of the game, I strongly recommend make a decision of whether or not you want to experience the game before you watch any more of this video, because I will be spoiling it for you. On with the show. What I dislike the most about Final Fantasy XV is what it could have been. Now this is not really a history and trivia channel. These days I focus a lot more on the experience of playing the games rather than the stories behind them. There are other YouTubers who can do a much better job of that than I can. I, uh, Super Eye Patch Wolf, uh, Ultima, I mean these are far better at this part of the storytelling uh, of making these videos than I am. But I have to talk at least a little bit about how this game was supposed to be Final Fantasy Versus 13. Even that seemed like a really odd choice to me, especially being that this obviously has nothing to do with that game. But that wasn't always the plan. It was supposed to be a spin-off of the 13 trilogy taking place in the same universe. The rather useless Luna Freya was supposed to be an infinitely more badass character. Now I want to circle back to that quick because I did write that line before I got through uh, some of the parts of the game where Luna Freya actually was kind of badass. But I understand a lot of the criticisms people have of that character. She has a few great moments, but for much of the much of the story, she doesn't really do very much. Uh, and, and the character she was supposed to have been was supposed to have been a much more active character in the story and have a much bigger role, a lot more screen time, and actually be part of the party and be on the adventure, rather than just kind of being this, this maiden in the tower that Luna Freya spends most of the game being. There were so many issues with the development of the game, and it was stalled several times for a number of reasons, to the point where they just said to hell with it and made it a new numbered entry for whatever that even means anymore. I mean, look at the numbered entries of the Final Fantasy games, it doesn't really seem like there's any particular standard of what makes it a Final Fantasy game or not. They have kind of side series like Tactics, but they also have MMORPGs that were just given a number, so where's the distinction supposed to be made? It's really not clear. Okay, uh, the Tactics games take place in Ivalice, so does 12. So what's that distinction? The Tactics games are, I guess, SRPGs. But why is an SRPG may not mainline, but an MMORPG is? It doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I don't really know the logic of why Square Enix does what they do in terms of deciding what's going to be a mainline entry and what's not. It probably has more to do with money than anything else. Anyway. Uh, Super Eye Patch Wolf has an amazing video where he really dives into that, so I strongly recommend heading over to his channel and watching the video Final Fantasy XV is a mediocre disappointment. Um, amazing video. Fantastic script. I can't put this guy over enough. He did tremendous work on that video. So uh, definitely, you know, give that a watch. The Cliff's Notes version of that whole story, though, is that a lot of compromises were made 
and the final product falls severely short of the vision of its original director, the somewhat notorious Tetsuya Nomura, whose name suspiciously still appears on the title screen. I wonder whose hand he shook to get that. Like he's not he he's not even involved past a certain point in the game anymore, but he has a credit on the main screen as as the uh, main character designer. I've never before heard of a game having one solitary credit on its title screen and that credit belonging to the lead character designer. That is weird. He was replaced with Hajime Tabata. Uh, Nomura was then reassigned to Kingdom Hearts 3 while Tabata was tasked with salvaging the work that had been done on Versus 13 up to that point. Knowing that even the publisher and developer were settling with this title, it's no wonder that it doesn't feel like a complete game to me at all. And that's because it isn't. My understanding is that there was supposed to be a whole like multimedia universe built specifically around the title, which explains why a large portion of the game content is missing. There are points of the game where just things happen off screen. Big important things, like Ignis loses his eyesight at one point, and just you're there and he just, he just happens to not have eyesight anymore, and, and they, they don't explain why, he doesn't tell you how he lost it. If you want to find that out, you have to get the DLC. That's a big, big problem. A big problem. The actual story of Final Fantasy XV can be completed in around 30 hours, and during that story you really don't learn a lot about the characters or why they are doing the things they're doing. When Noctis learns of his father's death, he has no reaction at all, and that always really bothered me. Shouldn't he mourn or be depressed or angry or sad? He, he just has absolutely no response. The characters aren't developed. They're not built. I don't understand why Noctis reacts that way. I don't understand who these three guys are to him. I don't understand why they're his entourage. I don't understand why they're all going with him. It's not explained. You don't learn why the Empire attacks Insomnia, which is, by the way, a terrible name for the city. You don't learn about how Noctis and Luna Freya met or came to be engaged. You don't learn about the relationship between the four characters in the car. You don't learn about the relationship between the protagonist and any other character, uh, whether it's a background character or a side character at all. You learn nothing about the villain or his motivation, unless you get the DLC. You don't even learn much about the world you're supposed to be exploring. For that, you'll have to consume an additional 20 or so hours of media outside of the game as well as all of the DLC that was not originally included in the retail release. And it's never good when DLC has to be released to fix a game. And consumers don't like paying extra for content that should have been in the game to begin with. And I know we do this like as a culture at this point. We all kind of clamor to like pre-order games, right? And we pre-order these games. And while I, you know, I feel like half the time, whenever a big title gets pre-ordered, Half the time, people wind up on the internet complaining about, you know, how bad the launch was or how much is missing from the game. And it, we do it again and again and again and again and again. And, and we keep on getting ripped off and we keep on paying the money, which is why they're going to keep on doing the same stuff. Game publishers are always going to do the same things they're doing as long as we as consumers keep on spending our money. But that's a little bit of a tangent. Let's get this train back on the rails. It is shameful and sad that the bulk of character development and establishment of setting, plot, and themes are all done outside the actual experience of playing the game. I understand the, the, the synergistic relationship that Square Enix was trying to create here, but look, Atlas tried this with Dot Hack in the early 2000s, and you didn't, you didn't even have to pay extra for those movies. They came with the game. On that note, though, King's Glaive is the name of the Final Fantasy XV movie, and uh, you should watch it. It's really good. Uh, it, it's, it's significantly better than the story of the game itself. The entirety of the Brotherhood anime is available for free on YouTube, and that explains the relationship between Noctis and his friends. Uh, really, they are better experiences than playing the game, which is really frustrating because the game's cut together so much like a movie that it really shouldn't be able to fail so spectacularly at telling its own story. Now, I will give it this. The game is a way better experience once you have watched King's Glaive and Brotherhood. But it shouldn't be. 
the game should be great without my having to watch all this extra stuff. I shouldn't have to do that. I shouldn't have to watch a movie and an anime and read a novel to get the rest- yeah, there's a novel to get the rest of the story. I should not have to do that. I should buy the game, and the game should have the story of the game contained in the game. I don't know why I have to say that out loud. That should be implied. Remember when I said before that the game could be completed in about 30 hours? There's like 100 hours of content altogether in this game. The side content is more than twice as large as the actual story of the game. And it's all tedious crap. You're running errands. There are monster hunts. Um, there are hundreds of them. There are maybe two or three that are actually interesting. Uh, there's fishing. fishing. Fishing is actually kind of fun. But it also takes you out of the game and makes it kind of boring. There were a few special hidden bosses uh, whose assets were purchased from a third com company studio in China and weren't even made by the talented designers at Square Enix. So you got a guy who put his name on the front screen as the lead character designer and did not design the assets for a lot of the characters that appear in the game. They actually outsource that. And it's just not quality content. It's all padding. So there's a 30-hour storyline in this game, of which 20 or so hours are missing. And then there's about 60 to 70 hours of padding. Just go look at frogs. My car broke down. Hi, Your Majesty. I know you're on a quest to save the country, but my car broke down. Why is the Prince of the Kingdom running around doing errands for, for all these common people? It doesn't make sense. And I got so swept up doing side quests when I first played this game that I was stuck in the first part of the game for like 30 hours, and it was totally pointless. I kept on doing side quests. I, care, I like forgot what the main story even was, which is just as well because they weren't, they weren't telling it anyway. But there's so much side content. I was running around the game world doing this crap for, like, weeks. Anyway, moving around the game world can be really relaxing, especially in the beginning. When you're in the first part of the game where you're just driving around in, in the car, it's very relaxing, and it kind of kills any tension that you might be feeling. You're just sort of driving around or sailing around, it just feels like you're on a trip with your buddies, not carrying the fate of the world in your hands. Now, to be fair, later in the game, that does improve, but that's after you've already spent how many hours on what seems to be kind of a relaxation simulator of a video game. How many people who played this game actually got there? Now, I mentioned before that the game world's not very well fleshed out. It just kind of seems unfinished, like there are parts of it missing. Not just parts of the story, but parts of the actual world. While I was playing, I just kind of felt like I was playing in the story. I just like kind of jumped ahead. And there are just like places that they didn't bother making. So instead of visit those places, you just kind of get auto moved to the next area. There's a part where you have to go back to the power plant. And uh, instead of like, you know, actually go there, it just kind of cuts and boom, you're there. Just, I guess, because they didn't want to put in the part of the game of you getting from the ship to the power plant, for whatever reason. And there's a huge disconnect between the countryside of Lucis and the fairy tale city of Insomnia. Now, now, this may be an attempt on the part of the writers to kind of flip the typical fantasy story blueprint on its head. In most fantasy stories, the hero starts in a rational world, sometimes our own world, and sometimes a world that's very similar to our own. But eventually, through some outside events, uh, you know, but outside the protagonist's control, they cross a threshold into a world of magic and wonder. And here the opposite happens, and it really doesn't work. Later on, you cross a threshold back into a magical world again, and then things get a lot more interesting. But here, just the, 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 the world is so mundane. It looks like a tourist trap in the American Midwest. It doesn't look like a Final Fantasy setting. It feels like you're just out in the country. The music fits the setting too, which, you know, it often has like a very western feel, depending on what part of the country you're in. 
And it's like you left Insomnia and went straight to Texas. You go from truck stop to truck stop. You hang out at trailers and hotels. You bring your car to the mechanic. It's just all... It's like stuff that you would normally do on a weekend. It's like someone at Square Enix decided that it would be fun for players to experience the world they already live in, but as a video game, and it is not. And again, I, I will clarify that once you get to, like, chapter 6 or 7, that does change because you have a very different setting that you're suddenly in. But then that setting doesn't have much to it. So yes, you do get to leave that area, but then the other areas you travel to are very tiny and have nothing in them. There's no content in them. Moving on. The world itself just doesn't make a lot of sense. You've got gas stations and diners out in the middle of nowhere with a big road looping around and monsters absolutely everywhere. There is no barrier between the tourist resort and the bloodthirsty creatures. At night, the demons come out, and if you're caught you know, driving at night, they'll kill you, but they won't kill you if you're having a burger down at the diner. Meanwhile, the people of Luthis just kind of like hang out in t-shirts and like tank tops. No one seems to even be worried about the monsters. Like, you go to the diner to get your hunts, and even the guy at the diner is like, oh yeah, I guess like if you want to go kill that, someone might pay you for it or something. But he's not worried. He's just working at his diner 50 feet away from the behemoth. They just kind of ignore the monsters and the fact that they even exist. Uh, it just, ugh. it it doesn't make sense. It's just it's 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 dumb. It's just dumb. It doesn't help at all that the assets are reused so often that you'll see the same exact NPC in the same room. The diners all look exactly the same. It's not too noticeable if you move quickly through the story, but once you start doing the side content, it starts to make the world feel really small. And I think that's the biggest problem with this game. The side content. If you just play this game storyline-wise and just go from beginning to end and don't do any of the side content, you won't notice. But all that side content exposes every single flaw in the design of the game. It fundamentally fails at basic world building, and this is something that any work of fiction should be able to do as part of its groundwork. Building a world that makes sense is not difficult at all, so how on earth did one of the most prolific video game producers in the world manage to royally screw it up like this? And I think the answer to that is adding all this side content and exposing how much it doesn't make sense. Now if that's not enough, there are several instances of really obnoxious product placement this game really wants to sell you cup noodles and Coleman camping equipment. Because as we all know, fans of JRPGs are avid outdoorsmen, am I right? I know that everyone watching this video right now is about to go camping in their RV this weekend, yeah? Obviously. On that note, the fact that you go camping at all in this game doesn't even make sense. You're never really all that far from the car. You can almost always quick travel back to the car, and you get a huge experience bonus if you rest indoors. You're also supposed to be urgently moving forward towards your goal, not like screwing around with your buddies in the woods. So it's weird. Uh, I guess it makes sense when there's a campground inside of a dungeon, but on the other hand, there's a campground inside of a dungeon. Why are there campgrounds inside of dungeons? I've never been in a dungeon in my life in the real world, but I'm pretty sure that there's not camping grounds there. I don't, there's a, I don't think there's a place to park your RV in, like, catacombs. So, I've talked about how badly they screwed up the game world, and how they didn't bother to write most of the story into the game, how the characters aren't developed, and how the story in much of the game world seems to be missing, but surely there's a saving grace here in the action and fighting portions of the game right? Now, I want to really quickly talk a little bit about how I am an old school Final Fantasy fan, so I might be a little bit of a purist, and boy, I miss the ATB type battle system, and not the current, not ATB that they have since 13, where it's like, it tries to be an action game, but also not at the same time and winds up kind of being neither a turn-based game nor an action game. It's kind of somewhere in a nebulous world that lives between the two sides. 
And I feel like with this game, they tried to make it fully an action RPG experience. It very much is. The battles are very alive. In fact, uh, they're kind of a boring chaos for the most part. Now, my feeling is that ever since they did away with the turn-based uh, kind of combat, the turn-based ATV combat, ever since then I feel like they've been trying to find something to replace it, but never actually did. So every time they make a new game, now they're like, oh, what do we do? Well, we can't do turn-based ATV anymore. So let's just come up with some sort of weird hybrid crazy nonsense system. And that's what they do, and every single time it's super divisive. Some people love it, some people hate it. Most of your classic fans hate it. Just find something else that works and stick with it. Or stick with the thing that worked to begin with. There's nothing wrong with a turn-based ATV system. It's fine. Games like that are still enjoyable. There was no reason to ever change it. But at some point, they decided... Hmm, every game should play like an MMORPG, and they just box themselves in, and now they're in this corner they can't get out of. So in Final Fantasy XV, you only control Noctis, and the three companions are controlled by AI. Except for when you do like these little mini quick time events for team-up attacks, which, I don't know, like I have a hard time even pulling them off anyway, just because you have to set them up a certain way, and it's tedious and not worth doing. Uh, I mean, those can make things a little more interesting, but there's nothing stopping you from just holding down the circle button for the entire fight and just, you know, use a potion when you need it. There's nothing at all stopping you from doing that. You can clear most of the game just by doing that. And then just keep on doing that and just outlevel everything. Like, I did so much side questing that I outleveled most of the content. Like, when I was just playing just before, uh, I'm in, like, chapter 10 now, or chapter 11, and all my guys are at like level 43, which is ridiculous. Like everything is weak next to me. All I have to do is sit there and hold circle. I can just face roll the entire game. I choose not to do that to make it more fun, but there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Uh, I get a lot of the blindside link attacks, which is like when you attack an enemy from behind, but the positioning in the game is so janky that you almost never do it on purpose. It's, it's usually by accident. And uh, there's not that much control over what's happening in these battles. You know, you're going to target whatever enemy is nearby. You can lock on an enemy. But then, if another enemy is, like, closer, it seems like Noctis will just sort of switch to that one anyway. So I'm not sure what matters. Uh, <clears throat> if you walk around at night, you see much stronger enemies. But after you do, like, about 150 battles with roving groups of Imperial troops that just randomly drop out of the sky... Suddenly those enemies aren't that strong anymore because you've been getting all this XP from fighting all these soldiers that drop out of the sky every 10 minutes in the game. And yeah, you can use magic to try and exploit an enemy weakness or take advantage of a staggered enemy who's in a vulnerable status. But because magic in this game works like a grenade and your partners are always clustered around the enemies, you can't cast any spells without exploding your teammates. And it's not like the area of effect on the spells is small. The area of effect on these spells is massive. It just takes up the whole battlefield. So like... Well, like if I'm going to cast a spell in this game, I'll stand like way on the other side of the world from the enemy, like as far as I can to be out of range of them. And then I'll throw the magic grenade, it blows up, it, it hits all of my teammates and all of the enemies. The only difference is because I'm so overpowered it doesn't kill my teammates, it only kills the enemies. But then the entire, uh, the entire battlefield is on fire, so I have to stand there and wait, otherwise I'm on fire. It just doesn't make sense. You can also seek out Noctis' royal arms, which are powerful weapons that can be used to defeat powerful foes, but using them damages Noctis. A single attack on a large group of enemies can do enough damage to kill Noctis, so there's really not much point in ever using them. Um, it seems like they just they do more harm than good. You don't There's no advantage to using them, but there is a disadvantage. They're stronger than your typical weapons, but it doesn't matter because your strong your, your typical weapons are strong enough to just sit there and hold circle until it dies. So do I need a weapon that lets me sit there and hold circle till it dies faster? Not really, because if it's damaging me, I just pop a potion. It, it, it doesn't matter. None of the strategic or tactical elements of this game matter. And you go through a whole tutorial where it explains them, and you can dodge and block and parry and do all these link attacks, and it sounds so cool and your, your extra characters have special moves that you can tell them to do at certain times. But it's all totally unnecessary. 
The worst part of it all though is that I really do want to love this game. I even did sink like 40 hours into it before I gave up the first time because it was just, it was tedious. It was so tedious. Those amazing moments were simply too few and far between, and for that matter, I really believe that this was a... I really believe this was a passion project. I think it started out that way for Nomura. I think he really did love this project. He really wanted to make it his own. He really wanted to put his, pour his heart and soul into it, and I think his team was on board for that. I just say that because there is definitely a feeling of love here. This, is, this was a labor of love. I can tell that. I think when Nomura was taken off the project and Tabata replaced him, I think that labor of love became a labor of money. And I think that speaks a little bit to kind of the, the internal issues we've all been hearing that Square Enix has been having over the past few years. And I think that's a lot to do with why things went the way it did. I'm not a fly on the wall, and I'm sure there are others who know more about this than I do. But from just what I do know, and just my guess, is that I think Nomura was taking his time. It was taking too long. They had issues with the engine and all kinds of issues and problems with the game. Nomura was working, I think, very hard to make this the game he wanted to make it, and it just wasn't happening. And I think they took him off the project and put somebody else on it who was going to make a game that was going to sell and make money. I think Nomura's game was not going to make money. They knew Tabata could make a game that was going to make money. This is just speculation. When the whole story is revealed, though, it is full of adventure, romance, political intrigue, humor, drama, themes of responsibility, control, family, friendship, legacy, and independence. It's just a damn shame that so little of that made its way into the actual game itself. And overall, Final Fantasy XV could have been so great, but it just never really got finished. It's a shell of what it should be. Uh, if you watch the movie and the anime and uh, then just play the game and skip all the side stuff, then it's actually a pretty good experience. And that's what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to just you know play the game and experience it um, you know, with the additional media sources and enjoy that story. And it is a good story. Uh, and you know you can you can have fun with it. I just wish that it would have stuck to that. Stuck to just tell me the story. Uh, the Pocket Edition does a way better job of that, by the way. The Pocket Edition just basically just does that. It just tells you the story. I think I would have liked this a lot better if it had given me the entire story and just told me the story and didn't try to didn't try to be Skyrim, didn't try to be Fallout. And if they had maybe given a little bit more thought to the way that the world works that they've created, I think it would have been a much better experience altogether. I wasn't really sure exactly where to fit this thought, but one thing that I noticed that really drove me nuts is that the load times are really long for this game. And that makes no sense to me. It, this game was released in what, 2016, 2018? I don't even remember anymore. Not the point. The point is, the load screens are so long. What are, why, why does any game still have a long load screen? Isn't the, isn't the hard drive in a PlayStation 4 uh, an SSD? Isn't it solid state? It's not a mechanical drive, is it? Because that takes forever to load this game, and it shouldn't. Games like this in today's world, you know, they shouldn't take that long to load. It, there's just no reason for it. They, they install the game to the hard drive on the machine so that it won't take so long. It doesn't make sense to have a game that you have three, four, five minute loading screens. It makes no sense. With all that being said, I want to come back around and say I don't think that Final Fantasy XV is so bad that it's unplayable. I think there are some really fun parts of the game. There are some big, amazing, epic battles that are really incredible. I think the story is fantastic. I think it's just not in the game. And that's my big problem with it. Uh, there's also a lot of those big, incredible moments are kind of reduced to these sort of interactive cutscenes. I mean, yeah, it's really cool Like when you fight Leviathan and there's a big giant sea monster that you're trying to fight, but then you suddenly become invincible and there's no point anymore to even having the fight because you're just sitting there holding the A button until it dies and you don't even have to use potions anymore. What's the point? It's a cutscene. Either, either make it a fight or make it a cutscene. Don't make it a cutscene that pretends to be a fight. 
Now, sadly, there were three more DLC packs that were planned for Final Fantasy XV, but all production of DLC on the game was stopped when Hajime Tabasa left the company, and he just said that he no longer felt motivated, which is really strange. All remaining DLCs were cancelled, and the team was reassigned to a new project. Uh, while both Tabata and Square have been very vague in their explanation as to exactly why this happened, I'm sure that didn't make shareholders happy. It sounds to me like Tabata was tired of working on a troublesome project, especially one to which he had already given six years of his life, um, you know, kind of picking up the pieces of somebody else's work. I think he was burned out and very likely tired of Square Enix's now notorious internal issues. I've never heard of somebody, you know, stepping down from a job like that because they, they're not, I don't feel motivated anymore. I mean, obviously this is a huge company. I'm sure they were paying the man very well to direct these massive projects. We're talking, you know, multi-billion dollar budget projects and he just walks off the project and says, I resign, I just don't feel motivated anymore. I feel like there had to be something more going on in order for Tabata to want to do that. Uh, the fact that all future DLC was dropped and the team was reassigned what that tells me is that Square Enix just wasn't that confident in the future of this game. It doesn't make sense to stop a project just because the director has resigned. Under normal circumstances, a new director would be appointed to finish that work. Instead, they had someone make a novel out of the rest of the story that was supposed to be told, which is obviously way cheaper to produce. So my thinking is they were losing money on this DLC and they didn't project that they were going to be making any money on this DLC. So I think that that's, that's really what it came down to. I don't think Tabata left and then they canceled all the DLC. I think Tabata found out they were planning on canceling the DLC and then he left. I, but logically, that just makes more sense to me. You know, if I was making, you know, a couple hundred bucks a year to direct these big projects, he's probably, he's probably making more than that. Uh, and then... Even if the projects weren't that great, I wouldn't just quit and like throw that money away. You know, you're getting paid a good salary to do, to do this work. No, I think he probably heard it through the grapevine that this is what was planning. He probably heard the guys upstairs were talking about, you know, canning this entire endeavor. And I think he, he decided he would rather go out, you know, go out a winner and resign before they made that announcement. But that's just my speculation. Uh, you know, I think that's a much more kind of Japanese way of handling those kinds of problems. If I can be so bold as to suggest that I might understand that culture in that regard, you know, in business, in, business in Japan is like that. You know, it's all about saving face. So I think that it might have been. I think Tabata may have resigned when he did to save face before having his project canceled. But again, just speculation on my part. I'm not a fly on the wall. I have no inside information. I'm just guessing. Now, on that note. Everything else I've said in this video about this game has been my opinion. I don't expect you to agree with me. Uh, I expect many of you to disagree with me. So let me know your feelings in the comments on this video. Do you think I should give Final Fantasy XV another try? Sound off below, let me know what you think. I have recently been playing a little bit, you know, because I want to know the rest of that story. I want to know what else happens. I got that I got that involved in it. And the only reason why I want to know the story and want to know what happened is because for this video, I watched the anime series and the movie in order to prepare for this video. And once I did that, I cared about the story. That's what it took. It took that media to tell pieces of the story that should have already been in the game to get me interested in the plot of the game. A cool idea in theory to sort of build up this multimedia synergy, but a bad idea in practice when you are asking your consumer to pay for your game and then pay for the story of your game separately from the game itself. Again, this is all just my opinion, but you let me know. If you think Final Fantasy XV is an absolute masterpiece and you think I'm wrong for feeling the way that I do, if you think the story was told well enough in the game, and you don't even need that extra content? Let me know in the comments how you feel. If you think I missed important or critical things about the game, good or bad, let me know in the comments. If you have more information or more insight as to what happened at Square Enix, why Nomura was taken off the project, why Tabata was uh, added to the project, why the project was canceled when Tabata uh, uh, said he was leaving. If you know more about that than I do, hey, let me know in the comments. I would like to know. I would like to learn. I'm not here just to tell, tell you what I think, I'm here to hear what you think too. Now this is a very long video, I hope it was entertaining. 
Until next time, game over. And if you enjoyed this, please do subscribe and enable notifications. I am going to do these kind of deep RPG editorial dive type videos uh, about once a month. So stay tuned for those. Thank you.